we will now have the official um, call to order, and we will ask for the roll call, please. Karen Kahn. Present. Craig R. Curry. Here. Carl Hopkins. Here. Jim Wilson. Here. Paul Bowen. Here. Dennis Houghton. Here. Carol Goodman. Here. <coughs> and moving on to changes to the agenda, do we have any changes? No changes. Okay. Uh, with that, we br brings us to the notices that on Thursday, January 10th, 2019, at 6 p.m., the Airport Commission Secretary duly posted this agenda on the bulletin board at Airport Administration. Next item is public comment. Uh, any member of the public may address the Airport Commission on any subject within the jurisdiction of the Commission that is not scheduled before them that same day. The total amount of time for public comment will be 15 minutes and no individual speaker may speak for more than two minutes. Do we have any speaker <coughs> slips? Madam Chair, no speaker slips. No speaker slips. And that brings us to our liaison reports. And I don't know that I see um, Council Member Jason Dominguez in the audience. So with that, we are welcoming our new City of Goleta liaison council member who will introduce himself. <laughs> Hello, I'm, I'm James Cariaco, and I'm, I'm new to the Goleta City Council, and I'm new to being the, uh, the liaison uh, to this commission, but I'm not new to this community. I was born and raised in Santa Barbara. Um, I'm also uh, a former staffer for Council Member Roger Horton, whose name I saw up on the, the plaque that was on the screen there a, a few moments ago. So I've been involved in local affairs for a number of years, and I'm looking forward to uh, to seeing, uh, seeing and learning more about the work that you do out here. Um, also just want to briefly congratulate you on, on selecting a new director, Henry Thompson. Um, the, the city manager informed us of this, and uh, she's very excited about that hire. She, she uh, said that she'd heard good things about Henry, so I'm looking forward to seeing what, uh, what you folks can do together. And uh, just lastly, I just want to say that I'm looking forward to uh, seeing how Goleta and the airport uh, and the city of Santa Barbara can continue to, um, to grow and develop our partnership and be better, uh, better and stronger regional partners. And um, looking forward to learning more about how we can communicate better with you, work better with you, make sure that you're up to date on the things that we're doing. And then I'm, I'm also hopeful that um, I can continue to learn more about uh, some of your processes and uh, how you notify us about things that are going on, um, whether they're positive or less than positive. And just looking forward to uh, learning more about what you do out here. Thank you so much. Thank you. James, could you spell your last name? Or just give K-Y-R-I-A-C-O. Thank you. And how do you pronounce that? <laughs> Karyako. Karyako. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. Great. Thank you. And that brings us to item three, Commission Matters, which is the uh, election of officers and subcommittee assignments. We have the recommendation that the commission elect a chair, vice chair, and make subcommittee assignments. With Ma Madam that, chair, if, if I will open the nominations for chair, unless you have a comment you'd like no, to make. No, no. All right, we, we, we will then say that the um, nominations are open for the position of commission chair. Madam Chair, um, looking ahead to this year and the issues that we're going to face with noise abatement, uh, the, the planning of the move of the fixed base operators, all of this with a new uh, director who is going to have to get his feet on the ground. I, I would like to nominate a slate, if I might, of Mr. R. Curry for president and Mr. Hopkins for vice president or chairs. Okay. Is there any discussion or any other nominations? I was just going to second his nomination. All right. Uh, th then it's been moved and seconded, if I have no objections, that we uh, have uh, the nomination of Craig Garcuri for chair and Mr. Carl Hopkins for vice chair. Any discussion? Then we will vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Okay. We have now a new chair, Mr. Craig Garcuri, and a new vice chair, Mr. Carl Hopkins. And with that, sir, I, tend <laughs> I, 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 I say, take it away, Craig. Okay, well, you're surrounded now. <laughs> okay, so we have the uh, subcommittee, uh, the subcommittee um, positions. So I think I'll just go through those one at a time, and we'll uh, 
uh, describe uh, what they are and what the, the responsibilities are. Craig, uh, would you like me? I, I have a, a suggested list of members. Go for do you it. Wanna go for it. Do you want to? Are you going to explain what the different? Why don't you go through the list and then I'll go through the. Other. Sounds good. We'll tag. All right. Here. So uh, there's uh, uh, currently six. That's air service, budget, general aviation, ground, tran ground transportation, and lease review. Air service uh, review and comment on the annual air service strategic plan, and that's of course the airlines and uh, their service to community and our service to them and um, how we work together. Um, review and comment on special recommendations by the airport director uh, or airline service consultants or consultant or consultants uh, regarding issues to air service development uh, in the future and provides recommendation to the airport commission as a whole. So many of these subcommittees, as everybody here knows, meet uh, at separate times and uh, work really drill down on one particular topic and uh, the presentations might be more thorough and more deeper dive and then that subcommittee makes a recommendation to the full commission and we go from there. So the first is air service. Do you, you want to go ahead and do all of them and then we'll... Yeah, that's a good. Idea. So budget committee, uh, review the airport's annual operation and capital budgets. Uh, you don't have to be an accountant to do that. <laughs> um, uh, the administration does a great job of taking a big pile of numbers and summarizing them. Uh, but the big pile of numbers is uh, presented if you want to <coughs> dig into it. <clears throat> and those of us, uh, you know, I've dug into it at times. I know Bruce has. Um, and I know, I'm sure other people have. Um, uh, both the operational and the capital budgets, and capital being much longer term planning. We have a partner here at the airport, as are all, all airports do. They're called the FAA. Uh, usually they're in alignment with our goals and needs, <laughs> but not always. Um, and, and so there's lots of long term <coughs> capital planning that is supplanted uh, also with help from the FAA, our good friends at the FAA, your tax dollars hard at work. Um, <clears throat> make issues uh, and make recommendations to the uh, full airport commission around those topics. So those uh, subcommittee meetings are usually pretty deep dives into the budget with great presentations by the airport admin staff. And um, uh, as long as I've been involved in it, we've always all stayed awake. So you guys have done a good job presenting somewhat dry material in at least energetic way. The general aviation subcommittee um, is uh, Review and provide input for the maximum standards, the minimum standards of, uh, we ought to maybe rename that the maximum standards, um, for the minimum standards. So all, all airports have to have a minimum standards document which describes the aeronautical activities, uh, how, uh, what kind of minimum requirements people have to meet to be part of that community, if you will, and operate on the airport. And that, that's kind of a, a framework document. It's a good thing to have and we refresh and renew that periodically. Um, so provide input uh, for the minimum standards for aeronautical activities, uh, which isn't just airplanes. Uh, uh, it's anything that occurs on the airport. And other issues regarding general aviation, which uh, just as an important point, and we have one, two, three, four, five, four pilots here on the commission and two and one in the audience there. Um, general aviation is not just little propeller airplanes. Uh, if it's not something you bought a ticket on at the airline counter, it's general aviation. Um, so that could be anything from a $80 million Gulfstream 650 or Global Express down to a little 172 or 152, no offense to 152s, awesome airplanes, and everything in between. And so that's a very dynamic range because uh, how the airport operates from the owner's perspective and from the airport's perspective on a 152, a little small airplane, compared to an a intercontinental jet is, is, of course, a different animal. And uh, make recommendations, uh, like all of these, to the full airport commission after doing a deep dive. So that's that one. Um, ground transportation uh, after you get here, and then uh, everything after that, when you walk out of the terminal or walk into the terminal, where you park, how you park, how you get from where you park to the airport terminal, taxis, Ubers, lifts, and whatever's going to come next. Uh, maybe we'll start delivering passengers by drone soon. Who knows? <laughs> um, and so that actually, it seems like it might be boring, but th that's a really important piece of the infrastructure because if we can't get people, people to the terminal and out of the terminal professionally and easily, then their experience here at the airport is not going to be as pleasant as it otherwise would be. 
<clears throat> um, so review and comment on plans and issues related to the airport ground transportation, such as taxi cabs, shuttles, transportation network companies, uh, and bring recommendations to the full airport commission. Almost last but not least, uh, lease review. So the airport uh, derives a great deal of revenue, um, a substantial portion of revenue from property at leases. Uh, that's not just the airline terminal and counter space, but it's all the commercial buildings we have across the street, um, a development that's in, pro have we, no, we have development across the street that'll be light industrial space. So all of those things require airport leases, the FBOs, the restaurant, and everything in between. And uh, we have a lot of property. We have a lot of property. It is usually in very great demand. And our occupancy is in the high 90s, and it's always been as far as I know. So uh, reviewing proposals for airport leases, some of those are really simple. Some of those are quite a bit more complicated. Um, review development projects and make recommendations to the full airport commission. You're seeing a common thread there. And last but not least, uh, noise abatement, which we've had a couple of committee or council meetings that or airport commission meetings that have been a little bit more energized. Uh, one of the byproducts of more airline service, which we're thrilled to have, is more airplanes flying in and out of the airport and um, the noise sensitive communities uh, uh, being more vocal about uh, when that impacts them. So the noise abatement uh, uh, committee is something that uh, kind of has been fallow for a while, uh, but I, I think we're going to probably re-energize that. And so that committee's review and comment on the noise abatement program. So those are the committees. Take it away, Carl. <clears throat> I've talked to some of the commission members and taken the list that we had from the current ones. Uh, unfortunately, had to remove some of uh, two of our departing commissioners and have come up with a the uh, current recommendations. I would uh, read through the entire item slowly for whoever is taking the minutes here and then open it up for discussion and if people agree we'll go ahead with this uh, slate of, of subcommittees. On air service the chair Karen Kahn, uh, the members Jim Wilson and Dennis Houghton and the alternate Paul Bowen. For the budget the chair Jim Wilson, along with Craig R. Curry and Paul Bowen, and Carl Hopkins as the alternate. The General Aviation, the Chair Craig R. Curry, Carl Hopkins, Karen Kahn, and Paul Bowen as the alternate. Ground Transportation, the Chair is Carl Hopkins, the, commission, the other two members are Dennis Houghton and Carol Goodman with the alternate is Karen Kahn. The lease review, the chair Carl Hopkins, Paul Bowen, Craig R. Curry, with Karen Kahn as the alternate. Noise abatement, Karen Kahn as the chair, Paul Bowen, Carol Goodman, and Dennis Houghton as the alternate. I would also note that and urge Commission members, um, only three commission members can part actively participate in a subcommittee meeting, but additional commission members may attend that subcommittee meeting as long as they do not participate. The, and these subcommittees are public meetings. They are noticed as a public meeting. Brown Act applies as a public meeting, and obviously, therefore, the public is invited uh, to attend those meetings. Um, by non-active commissioners, that is people who are not specifically on the subcommittee, it's a great way to learn about that subcommittee for future years. So that is my suggested slate. If there's any comments, questions, whatever, I turn it over to the chair. Questions? I otherwise, go ahead, Jim. Uh, <clears throat> I'm, I'm pleased to remain on the two committees that I'm on now, um, Budget and Air Service. Any other comments, questions? So I'll go ahead and make a motion to, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Uh, I'm pleased with the committees I've been selected for. Okay. Okay. Uh, well, then I'll go ahead and make a motion that we adopt that slate as it was just outlined. Anybody second? I would like to second that motion. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. That's unanimous. Uh. I'll take care of it. So 
we, we were discussing that um, we have a little bit of a gap in that um, there's a person who's been acting as secretary uh, really for the um, airport commission and um, getting the notices up and taking attendance and all of those things. And we recognize we never formally said that she's the secretary. So I don't even know that we need a discussion on this other than formally recognizing that Mo or Maureen, and we all know her by Mo. I don't even know her last name. <laughs> Graham. 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 Maureen Graham, um, <coughs> just be recognized as uh, continuing to act in the capacity as secretary uh, to the airport commission. Do we have any discussion, or I don't even think we need a motion on that other than. Well, I was going to uh, so move. Okay. Well, Second. We'll, all in favor? Aye. 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 So there we go. And, and I would say thank you, Mo, very much. We appreciate what you and all you do for us. Thank you. Yes. Okay, so we'll move on to the consent calendar. There's uh, one, two, three, four, five items on the consent calendar. Uh, it's a recommendation that the Airport Commission <coughs> waive the reading and approve the minutes of the, oh, I'm sorry, I skipped ahead there. Um, uh, the, the minutes of the commission meeting Wednesday, December 19th, 2018 and approve the consent calendar. Do I have a motion for that? I so move. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 And motion carries. That takes us to number nine in some administrative reports. The first being the Northeast Apron Rehabilitation Project and Northeast Hangar Permanent Power Update. Hallelujah. <laughs> yeah, so we are very, very excited to have Lee Reynolds, our project engineer, with us tonight to give a, a full overview of the, the wonderful success of the construction project that just culminated. Take it away, Lee. Thank you, Chair Curry, members of the Airport Commission. I am happy to report that the power is restored finally at the Northeast Hangar, but first we're going to talk about the Northeast uh, Apron Rehabilitation Project. There we go. So this was a project that uh, we undertook um, really starting the design once we knew the <coughs> leasehold was coming back to the airport. And so what we did is we kind of prioritized the areas of the apron as to which areas we would work on first. And um, you guys, I think, are familiar with the apron, but um, that's it there. It's kind of divided it, and we divided it into five different areas. It's the area around Hangar 1, which is now Hangar 11, Hangar 2, Hangar 3, which is FedEx, and then all the way around Hangar 4, you can see is the majority of the apron. And then the uh, decommissioned portion of taxiway delta is also part of the area we defined. Um, so these are the square yards for each of those areas, and you can see Hangar 1, um, 6 to 8, I've just crossed off those areas because hangar one, two, and three is now done. Uh, we did full reconstruction on hangar areas one and two. In hangar area three, we were able to get by with just a uh, grind and overlay. All of the areas were evaluated. Um, the pavement was evaluated based on the aircraft um, using those hangars in front of the pavement. So. Um, hangars 1 and 2 had pretty much the same structural section with hangar area 3 being able to just do the grind and overlay. The hangar area 4-1 and 4-2 area are large areas um, that you can see, and then the taxiway delta area is about 2,500 square yards. The brief history is the tenant occupied and maintained the area since 1966. That's when the apron was constructed. The pavement sections vary, but generally they were 3 to 11 inches of asphalt pavement with no base. The area out in front of Hangar 1, which we know today as Hangar 1, was, of course, added on at some point, and that was the area that only had 3 inches of pavement in front of it. Uh, the costs, and as we were mentioning before, we do have a partner, and our partner is the FAA, and we really do like the FAA because they pay 90.66% of the project costs. Um, Design and construction management was 395,000. The construction uh, was 2.2 million, and the total was 2.6 million. Uh, we started out with um, slurry sealing the portion around Hangar Four, 
And we did that so FedEx and other aircraft could get in and out while we were working on the Hangar 1 and 2 aprons. Um, the slurry seal is really a band-aid for that area. We recognize that and we put it down so we could, you know, have aircraft traverse that while we were working and we can have aircraft park in the area now. So it's a, not a long-term fix, but it's a short-term fix until we can come in and reconstruct the rest of the apron. Once we finished the slurry seal, then we moved on to the hangar one and two area. And the photo on the left just shows the uh, pavement grinder, and the grinder takes away all of the existing pavement in one fell swoop. Um, photo on the left, they're just starting. The photo on the right, all of the pavement has been removed from the area. After that, we have this large piece of equipment that comes in. It's basically a very large rototiller, and we put down lime, and it mixes it 18 inches into the subgrade. So that's for soil stabilization. When we do that, we can put a lesser section of base and asphalt on top. And at the airport, where we have water at about four feet down, we really can't go. Our goal is to stay as high as possible with um, the excavation because the further down we go the more trouble we get into so this piece of equipment mixed the lime in and Once it did that it gave us a stable subgrade to place the base the photo on the right is all of the base being placed and um, That's about 10 inches of base on top of this firm subgrade that the lime treatment created We also um, put in a new valley gutter along hangar one this if you're familiar with the area, um, the parking lot had a trench drain that drained through the area before that hangar was built, Hangar 1. And it was, the grades were quite odd. Uh, the, in some places, the trench drain was covered with asphalt. Some places it surfaced. And there was a very large drop at the uh, northwest corner of Hangar 1. So by putting in this new valley gutter, we've di directed the drainage here and we've really flattened out the apron. Um, and I can report that in the recent rains we've had, the drainage appears to be outstanding. This is really working well. This has a less than 1% slope to it, which people say you can't do. But in fact, you can if you have to. And at the airport, we always have to. So that is in place now. Um, the future, Hangar 4 and Taxiway Delta, we've got a cost estimate for it, 3.2 million. We have applied for supplemental AIP funding. Um, we did get supplemental AIP funding for the FedEx apron, so that's what was used for that. The second phase of supplemental funding, um, the word on the street is it's not going to be so much for California airports. So we're not real expectant to get that, and as such, we have put money in our um, our capital planning program for the FAA is called the ASIP, and so we have programmed 2020 to finish the reconstruction of the Hangar 4 and Taxiway Delta area. So that concludes that part of the presentation. Uh, the next part is the Northeast Hangar Power Restoration, and in I'm sorry. Can I ask a question Absolutely. before we move on? Please. If you would back up to the beginning oh. photo that actually had some color coding, I think it might be helpful particularly to our new commission members to use those colors to relate to what you did do and where oh, it was oh, done. Yeah. So if you go back to the very first picture, right. you resurfaced the green, the brown, the dark gray, which if you could kind of describe it in that. No. Sure. Or, or what, what did you do and what didn't you do? Right. We slurry sealed the green and the brown area. Great. Thank you. We reconstructed the area outside of Hangar 1. That's on the right side of the slide. We also reconstructed the area outside of Hangar 2, which is just at the end of Taxiway Charlie there. And then we, um, we ground and overlaid the pavement outside of Hangar 3, which is where the FedEx aircraft is parked on this slide. So we completed you know, in its final form of reconstruction, three out of the five areas of the apron. Taxiway Delta, the blue area, we haven't touched. And, you know, it's, it's really bad. Um, 
the other two areas are really bad too, but we put the slurry seal down there. Great, thank you very much. You're welcome. Uh, my question is, why are we doing anything to taxiway delta in that I thought that had, with the shortening of uh, two five, that uh, that taxiway is no longer being used? Uh, Commissioner Hopkins, the reason we are going to work on the decommissioned portion of taxiway delta is because it's basically an apron leading from the northeast hangar to taxiway hotel. So if you uh, want to get out and you don't want to go taxiway Charlie, okay, that's what you're on. So that part por portion of Delta is still active, the portion that takes you to uh, hotel. Uh, that's right. Taxiway Delta actually stops right where the blue line stops. So the what I have in blue is not taxiway Delta. It was decommissioned many, many years ago, decades ago. And so it's just ramp. Oh, okay. And does Taxiway Hotel, I mean, yeah, Taxiway Hotel join up to that? Yes, it does. Okay. That's but we it, can't it's out see of the it. picture, so we can't see it on this photo. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. And just one more question. On the uh, brown area, there's a thrust, uh, a thrust fence. Yes. Is that, are, are we, is that structure staying? Is it usable? Is it... Uh, what are we doing with that? Chair R. Curry, I am going to defer to our facilities manager, Jeff McKee, to answer that question. Okay, thanks. Right now the ramp isn't in a condition really to use that as a run-up area, so we'll be looking at that as we do the remainder of the ramp to make sure it's And that, the brown area is the area that <laughs> we have submitted but don't really expect AIP funds to cover, right? So we're That's correct. correct. Okay, thank you. And to clarify, we don't expect supplemental AIP funding, which would uh, allow us to do it this fiscal year. Got it. We've submitted the in the ASIP for 2020, 2020, which would be May of 2020. In theory, we'd start construction. Understood. Is the blast fence still usable in the brown area? The, there's a barrier there, right? The blast fence is still there. We haven't looked at its you know, integrity yet, just because the ramp is so bad. There's FOD, it's just not usable in that sense. Okay, thank you. All right, I will fast forward. Quick explanation, FOD is the crumblings that ramps do when they decompose and airplanes don't want to be near them. So if there's junk sitting around there, airplanes don't want to taxi by it. It makes nasty dents in propellers and ingestion and engines is not good. All right, I will start the presentation for the Northeast Hangar Power Restoration Project now. Um, actually, I think I skipped a slide. There we go. So on August 8th, 2016, the power failed at the facility. And what happened was the electrical feeder, which is basically a big cable, that was coming out of the switchgear and going into hangar Four fried. It actually, it arced. It didn't catch fire, but it arced. And when it arced, it shut down the switchgear. So when Edison came out, um, you know, to look at that, they looked at the condition of the gear and what had happened, and they pulled their electrical feeder from the switchgear. They said, we cannot feed this any longer. It's out of service. Um, so at that time, the leasee had a choice on what they wanted to do in terms of getting this switchgear back in operation. And I believe the leasee did um, try, they made an attempt to fix the gear, but the gear was installed in 1966. And installing gear that was put in in 1966 is not a good idea. It's probably not feasible. I think she found that out pretty quickly and in the meantime, she did it, it uh, install an emergency generator to provide partial power to the facility. Um, once I think she learned a little more about what was involved in the repair, um, she decided to go with the generator for the remainder of the lease. And um, that's how the, the facility was partially powered from you know, August 8th to May 8th, 2018. So we were getting the 
facility back on May 8th, and we knew that, and we wanted to um, protect our reversionary interest and get power onto the facility, permanent power, as soon as possible once the hangar was um, reverted back to the city. So um, in December of 2017, uh, the city council authorized funding to replace the electrical components of the switchgear, the switchgear itself. Um, in February 2018, we bid the switchgear, and I think we had six bids, as I recall. Imperial Electric of Goleta was the low bidder at $625,000. So that's a picture of the old gear. And it's basically just, um, you know, a, a metal box with components inside. And here is a picture of our new gear. It is um, fully functional, of course, because power has been restored, you know, just before the new year. I think it was December 26th or 28th, one or the other. Um, Edison came out, even, even though they had the fires to deal with, they came out and had a nighttime shutdown um, December 20th. They pulled the new feeder into it, and then um, there was a process of our contractor testing the system very carefully to make sure the new feeders that went to each of the hangers functioned fine, and um, he turned it all on and everything worked great. The one thing you'll see that I'll point out um, is this switch gear is elevated four feet above existing grade. And the reason for that is we are in the flood zone at this location. And the building code says if you're in the flood zone, you must elevate your structure at or above the base flood elevation. We have a new code in Santa Barbara that also says you must not only elevate to the base flood elevation, you must elevate one foot above the base flood elevation. And so this gear is four feet above existing grade, which happens to be um, existing grade is very, very close to the base flood elevation. And what the base flood elevation is is simply it's the elevation which you would expect a 100-year flood to come up to. So um, three feet of that new pad, um, we would expect the water to come up to, and then we have one foot of freeboard. So if that ever happens, we'll all be taking photos. I don't know that it ever has happened in the past, but you know, for, for history for the new commissioners, you know, this is exactly what we've done on the airfield electrical vault. It's exactly what we've done on the uh, airline terminal. And it's exactly what we're doing on the buildings across the street. So any new construction on the airport is elevated at or above the base load elevation. Um, design and engineering on this one uh, was seventy thousand dollars. Our construction is seven fifty-five, and for those of you who just recall, I said it was the bid was six hundred twenty-five thousand dollars. Once we um, got the new gear. We tested the feeders from the gear to each of the hangers. They didn't carry any uh, electrical current. They had failed. So after we bid the project, we had to do a change order to replace the feeders from the gear to each of the hangers. And as you know, you can imagine, the distance between the gear and hangar two is quite a ways away. So we had to put new conduit and new uh, cable in all of those. That's why. The total cost came up to 755, with a project cost of 825. Any questions on that project? Uh, Leif, I had a question that I forgot to ask sure. back on the prior one, um, but thanks for the update on the power. What's the base composed of? The the base that was put down? It's aggregate base. It's just uh, rock and crushed rock. There's a certain gradation that the FAA requires, and um, it's, it's just rock and crushed rock. Hmm. Okay, thanks. You're welcome. Thanks for the report, Leif. Any questions? The, I noticed that it appears as though uh, that area was all paved with asphalt. Is that correct? Which area? Are the, you to? the ones that you reconstructed, one, two, and three. Yes, that's correct. Now, earlier, a year or two ago, there was some substantial um, ramp work done over there in the signature area that was all concrete. Correct. Why one versus the other? Well, the entire north 
side apron on the field is concrete, and that was constructed by the military, you know, back in the 40s. So when we go in, we generally replace like for like on this north side here, but concrete costs versus asphalt are, are significantly higher. So um, if we were to construct this north apron, you know, today, the entire north side, we would most likely do it in asphalt just because it's so much cheaper. So the northeast hangar apron, um, we did it in asphalt. It was like for like, and we probably wouldn't have been able to do nearly as much as we did if we switched to concrete. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, I had a question for Lee Fonsenal. Uh Getting back to the power issues, you were saying that all four of the feeds to the individual hangers had failed and you had to replace cable and conduit? What had happened was the, the original failure was the feeder between hanger four and the switch gear. Okay. So that one, had, that one was the original problem. We had replaced that as part of our project bid. Um, there are only two other feeders because as hanger one was an add-on, mm -hmm. hanger two transformer actually feeds hanger one as well. Okay. So we tested the feeders of hanger two and three after we started the project and the feeder to hanger two had also failed. We didn't know it because we didn't have power in it for, you know, two years. Mm -hmm. But when we tested it prior to putting power in, it had failed. So two of the three had failed. We decided to replace the one that hadn't failed as well. Sounds like a good idea. Thank <laughs> you. You're welcome. Okay, thanks. Uh, thanks, Leif. You're welcome. I'm sure I speak for everybody over there that is just thrilled about the power <laughs> and the ramp as well. Um, okay, moving on, uh, we have an administrative report on the uh, noise abatement program. That's correct. Uh, Kelly Reed will be speaking just kind of a, a brief overview of uh, some noise abatement activities that have taken place historically at the airport and kind of where we are regulatory moving forward, and then of course that will shape the future of our future noise discussions within the subcommittee. All right, <clears throat> good evening, thank you. Um, so I want to touch a little bit on the history of the Noise Abatement Committee uh, for those of you um, that might not be familiar, and I'm going to mention a few items that I have before just to um, get the new commissioners um, up to speed with all of us. So our, our basic goals of our noise abatement program are to uh, achieve operations, airport operations, that are compatible with the surrounding communities to the best of our ability, uh, to provide the region with facilities to access the national air transportation system, uh, to maintain a continuing dialogue between uh, the airport, airport users, and the surrounding community. And we do that through our noise abatement program. Uh, again, I'm going to touch on these key points um, that explain the responsibilities of the airport, FAA, and pilots. Uh, so number one, the airport, our, our primary responsibility is to make sure we have safe facilities for aircraft to use. Um, we do manage the uh, Santa Barbara Airport's voluntary noise abatement program, and I say voluntary because it is voluntary to pilots. It's not a regulated um, system or regulated approaches. It's voluntary, but we find most people willingly comply. Uh, and we have the airport has no control over how or where aircraft are flown. Uh, the FAA does have that control. Um, they formulate and enforce the rules and regulations for aircraft in flight. Uh, they ensure that aircraft remain a safe distance from each other, so safe spacing. Uh, and they, uh, again, have authority over aircraft in flight. Uh, lastly, the pilot in command, um, the name speaks for itself, but they have responsibility for um, uh, the safety of the flight and federal law does give them that uh, authority with respect to how the aircraft is operated. So a brief history of our noise abatement program. There's a lot of numbers here, um, but it really just speaks to the timeline of what all we've done. Um, uh, 1978 was when the noise abatement committee was established. Uh, the first committee was held in January of 1979. Um, Jump forward almost 10 years later, um, United introduces stage three, what we call quiet aircraft, to the area. And I'll talk about that in a few slides. Um, 
1989, uh, the FAA initially approved our uh, noise exposure maps and noise compatibility <laughs> program, and I'll talk on that a little bit more. Um, also, 1990 is the FAA Airport Noise and Capacity Act. Um, this is just a brief overview. I'll go into these in a little more detail. 1992 was our first uh, remote noise monitoring system installation. Um, a few years later, six years later, in 1998, we uh, updated the noise monitoring systems with technology that was, at the time, state-of-the-art. It's obviously no longer state-of-the-art. Um, 2001 uh, was a key year. That's when we began the, um, the FAA Part 150 Noise Compatibility Program. Um, it's a, it was a three-year project for us. Um, in the middle of that, we updated our noise exposure maps. Um, and then completion of that Part 150 process that I'll explain a little bit more in detail um, in 2004. Uh, 2004 through 2016, we saw continued success of our noise abatement program, which is our outreach and our uh, education to pilots in the community and our noise, voluntary noise abatement approaches. Um, I'll go into a little bit more about that gap in a later slide. Uh, and then I want to note that the end of 2018 was when Airport Commission uh, requested that the Noise Abatement Committee, which had in recent years gone to an ad hoc status, meaning we would meet when there was a need. We were still um, compiling the reports, conducting the information, but there wasn't the community involvement that we had seen in the past. So um, at the, at the uh, request of Airport Commission, we're moving forward with that this year. And lastly, um, public view is something that we're adding to our noise abatement program. So to speak a little bit more to some of these topics, uh, the Airport Noise and Capacity Act, um, this is important because it essentially uh, got rid of, ultimately got rid of the noisiest of the aircraft. So it, um, fa it created a process to phase out uh, stage two aircraft, which were the loudest aircraft operating uh, and restricted use to stage three. Uh, so we now have stage three and stage four aircraft operating throughout the United States. Um, stage two are not permitted anymore within the 48 contiguous states. Um, so one thing I want to mention um, before I jump into the Part 150 study, um, because we're a, a commercial airport, we receive federal money from the FAA through their grant process as an assurance of receiving that grant. There's several different grant assurances that we are required to meet um, that are set up by the FAA. So ec Grant Assurance 22 is economic non-discrimination. -discri and this is important and key because it says that we, um, essentially says that we're not able to um, limit or restrict access to aircraft. Uh, and this, is, this was throughout the country, not just here. But um, in 1990, when they issued this, it said that airports can no longer um, limit hours of operation or restrict certain aircraft or uh, fixed wing or helicopter. Um, and this is important because um, there are some airports out there that have uh, had programs prior to that act in 1990 grandfathered in. So some of our uh, airports to the south have uh, curfews on uh, aircraft operating times or they have limitations that were grandfathered in and we did not ha have any of that prior to this act and that is what limits us 1990 moving forward um, to stay open for um, fair use for aircraft, which is why we're here. We're an airport. Um, uh, so the, let's see, just a brief overview of the Part 150 noise study. Um, it's a big study and, and it's describing it would be its own presentation. Um, but what the, the purpose of it is, is to um, develop a noise compatibility pro compatibility program uh, that does not impose an undue burden on interstate or foreign commerce um, and that does not um, limit safety uh, or adversely affect safe and efficient use of airspace. Um, so again, stressing that we are not able to limit the airspace or hours of operation for aircraft. So within our Part 150 study, um, again, it was conducted from 2001 through 2004 study cost was uh, 300000 and um, that was, uh, again, a partnership with the FAA. Uh, and the goal of it is to uh, improve the compatibility between aircraft operation and our noise-sensitive communities. Um, and through that study, we determined measures to abate noise, aircraft noise, which is our voluntary noise abatement approaches that we have now, um, and also uh, ways to control land development and uh, mitigate the use 
mitigate the impact of noise on uh, non-compatible land uses. Um, I, within that timeline, there was a gap in time that I didn't explain um, between 2004 and, two, and current years. Um, through our, our Part 150 study, we did receive uh, grant money after that fact uh, from the FAA. Um, and we, from 2006 forward, we've been using a, a noise abatement system to um, be able to track and research the noise complaints that we receive and take appropriate action educating aircraft operators. So that process, that um, system has been in place since 2006. The operator changed names a few times and uh, we did receive FAA grants in 2007 and 2010 to provide uh, system upgrades to that. Uh, the most recent was um, 2015 when we um, took that system again to city council to seek approval to basically continue using the system that has been working for our noise abatement needs. Uh, so our, the, the crux of that or what we do now is our noise abatement program outreach, which is um, educating airlines, uh, corporate aircraft, general aviation, and airport stakeholders, um, finding out what their needs are, finding out if they're having difficulty meeting our noise abatement procedures, um, looking for any um, weaknesses within the system, and just really looking for ways to continue to provide that education. That's been the key piece. So the last um, part of this is, and what we're doing this year moving forward, is uh, adding public view to our existing uh, noise abatement software, which is uh, called Environmental View through um, Harris Corporation. So this is, um, we're in the final steps right now of um, completing our contract. Uh, when this is launched, so it's not launched yet, but this is really our first opportunity to explain to you what it is. It's, um, it's going to be a system that the public can access via our website and be able to create their own account and essentially get um, real-time aircraft data, flight data, and relate that to their house. So it's usable on a smartphone, on a tablet, or a computer. Um, it ha it's real-time with a 10-minute security delay. Uh, it also has real-time weather, uh, and it can also play historical information. Um, it's quick, it's simple. Um, public will be able to create an account, log in, um, quickly and easily enter a noise complaint, uh, and be able to get real-time data and uh, more information if they want m beyond just what just that one specific noise complaint. Um, it's a system we've that's been out there for a while. It's becoming increasingly popular, um, and we're very excited to add that to the system that we have now. And so, for the for those who maybe haven't seen this, um, I wanted to include the information on our two noise abatement approaches. So we have a um, noise abatement approach for high performance aircraft, which you can see, uh, it's hard to see, but the red dashed line there um, is, this is our voluntary noise abatement approach for runway 25. We ask that pilots come in over the open space of Moore Mesa and make a diagonal turn um, to base to final to runway 25. For our uh, VFR aircraft, or primarily for general aviation aircraft, they have a tighter turn in if they're going to be landing on runway 25, or we ask that they remain over the ocean or overfly the 101 uh, at all times when safety allows. Um, and I did want to mention uh, a couple stati statistics that didn't make it into this. Um, fiscal year 2018, the airport had um, just over 95,000 total aircraft operations. So an aircraft operation is a takeoff or landing. Um, we had 670 noise complaints for fiscal year 2018, so that equates to 0.007%. Uh, it's less than 1% of our total operations that an aircraft flew in a manner that um, constituted in or resulted in a noise complaint. Uh, last month, December, uh, we had 8,514 aircraft operations, uh, 193 noise complaints, and that's uh, 2%. So we have seen a spike in the last six to eight months um, of more noise complaints. But I just wanted to give you a broad picture. We, we do take every noise complaint seriously. We, um, we research and follow up on every single noise complaint. But when you look at the big picture, it is a small percentage of these flights that are, um, are not flying the noise abatement approach. And our hope is that through our education, we, we continue to whittle that number down. Any questions?
Uh, yes. How, how did the number of complaints in uh, December compare with November and October? December was higher than the last two months. D December was higher. Mm -hmm. Do we still have the noise monitoring system, and it, is it operable? The noise monitoring systems are still out there, uh, but they're not operating anymore. They're uh, older technology, um, as I shown in the, one of the previous slides. They were installed in 1998, and the technology just simply isn't supported anymore. Um, the part of the upgrades that we're getting to our environmental view system um, will provide the data that those monitors did previously. Thank you. I should also point out that during the government shutdown, the uh, number of controllers we have available to guide airplanes is substantially reduced. So their ability to monitor and enforce desired flight paths is also reduced since they're working hard. I'm told that all of the trainees are gone and that the only people left working in the tower are the full performance controllers who, of course, are working without pay. So. You know, the fact that the noise complaints are up, I would say, is not pr particularly startling. Um, the other point I would make is that as the chair of the newly formed Noise Abatement Committee, uh, one of the things we're going to be looking at is the naming of the areas we'd like people to fly over because, in my mind, there's quite a misnomer, even though we locals know about it, but if we want them to fly over the big open space and we don't want them to fly over Hope Ranch, a lot of people equate the word ranch with a big open space. So um, you, they say avoid Hope Ranch and they're trying to avoid the big open space. So I think that's something that we're going to be looking into as to how we can better describe the areas where we do want them to fly over the big open field, please and the places we'd like them to avoid so that we don't use local names, which I think are confusing. Um, Kelly, thank you for the presentation. And I am also looking forward to working on the noise abatement subcommittee. I think the large number of people that had been attending our meetings just recently shows that we really do have a serious problem to address. And of course, we can't tell the pilots where to go but I'm very pleased with the data you've presented today. And I'd like to point out for the public, wh whoever's listening, that uh, <coughs> the reason uh, Karen Kahn is the chair of that committee is that she's a retired United Airlines, or previously Continental, captain, and thus has a, the perspective from an airline st or standpoint uh, as, as how the pilots of the airliners and to a certain extent the large jets that are the ones that are causing these complaints, how they operate, which is significantly different than those like myself who fly little piston airplanes. So um, she will be able to bring uh, that perspective uh, to the noise and hopefully with working with the uh, air traffic control, um, we'll be able to get some resolution on this. Alrighty, if nothing else, thanks, uh, thanks Kelly. And with that, we'll ask our interim director to give its, what will probably be his final director's report. That's accurate. Yes, I, I do anticipate this will be my final director's report as, um, as James was mentioning when we uh, kicked off the meeting. Uh, the, the city administrator has recently been working with city council and, and uh, airport commission to select uh, a new airport director. So um, as indicated, Henry Thompson from Shreveport, Louisiana will be joining us February 1st, and that's scheduled to be his first day with us here in office. So we are very pleased and excited to have him join. So, um, and with that being said, um, yeah, I will be returning back to my, my, my previous seat and Kelly will be resuming her role as operations supervisor. So uh, we, we sincerely appreciate all of her, her time and dedication um, to this effort. So thank you, Kelly. Additionally, um, as you may have seen the uh, news over the weekend, we, we did have a, a little incident with regard to a fire suppression system at our newly acquired facility, the Northeast Hangar facility. 
Um, this was, uh, you know, the incident is still under investigation at this point, but essentially what happened was there was a, 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 a trigger within the system that initiated the, the cannons within the facility. And when I say cannons, I should probably explain that um, <laughs> <laughs> they are, it's, it's an aqueous film forming foam. It's a very similar agent to what our fire trucks carry. So if there were an airfield type incident that required fire suppression, the fire trucks would use the same type of chemical. And really it's meant to blanket a petroleum diesel type product so that you can stop the combustion of the oxygen that occurs above the petroleum product itself. So the good news, um, the, the system did function as we anticipated, but we also recognize that with it being an older facility, there are some, some bugs within the system that will be worked out as we have taken ownership and, and we'll be working through these, these challenges. And then, um, I believe we also had mention of the uh, impact to the federal government shutdown, and I just wanted to reiterate that uh, within the Santa Barbara area, we're, we're hearing you know stories perhaps of frustration or things of that nature, but we have seen an amazing commitment to the safety and security of this facility from the federal government workers that are, that are working here today, and, and we want to just uh, really extend our appreciation for the commitment to safety and security that we've seen from these individuals. So um, with that, that concludes my report, and if there are any questions, um, we'd be happy to take them. Uh, I had one, st not really a question, more a statement. Uh, Aaron, you're a young man early in your career, and our new director is a very senior person, so who knows, you may yet give director's reports. <laughs> Thank you, Paul. Yeah, thanks, uh, Aaron, for your, uh, for your time filling in as interim director, and we've already had a couple of you know, interesting things to get involved in, so thank you. Um, I had a, a question. The, uh, the, I have to think of a different name than cannon. Cannon and airplane just don't necessarily <laughs> go together, un, un, unless it's a military plane. But was there any damage to the equipment? I mean, there's some pretty big airplanes in there. Was there any damage? So we, we have not seen that there is physical damage to any aircraft. Um, all of this is still obviously under investigation. Um, you know, aircraft did come into contact with the aqueous film forming foam. Um, the impacts of that, I, I can't speak to that. I'm, I'm not a chemical engineer and can't speak to the interaction, but um, we'll, we'll work through the process and, and proceed accordingly. But we didn't have a bunch of airport operators uh, uh, attacking us, telling them to buy a new jet, right? I mean, so we... I mean, no, that, I, okay. I don't believe that's the case. <laughs> Those darn things are expensive. Okay, cool. Alrighty, well, with that then, uh, that brings this edition of the Airport Commission to a close, and uh, we'll adjourn.